Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Hello and welcome to the Dementia Care Partners podcast series brought to you by Positive Approach to Care. I'm your host, Greg Phelps, along with Tifa Snow, and our topic today is one that we've touched on previously, but today perhaps we can go a, a little more in depth. Uh, the question is, which dementia risks can I take and do genetics play a role? So mm, let's answer the first one first and then look at reducing risk factors. So no, let's okay. answer the last one first. Let's 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 go with genetics first. I'll get it straight. Uh, first one first, last one last, meh. Second one in the middle. Okay, so whichever one we go with, we got to do them both is what I hear you saying. Sure. So, so what role does genetics play in which dementias? Is that is that one of the two that you well, would let's like? Let's go with that. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So, four different kinds of Alzheimer's. Oh, did you just hear me say for different kinds of Alzheimer's? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, and I just sort of yeah. scratched my head on that one. Okay. Yeah, because Alzheimer's is not all one form or type or I mean it does have characteristics that make it Alzheimer's in other words you got beta amyloid plaque and you got tau pathologies both of them how you got them though can vary and so there's one form of Alzheimer's called pre and it's a type where if you get one gene from either parent you will get young onset Alzheimer's it's a dominant gene. It is a gene that triggers the onset of the development of the beta amyloid plaque and some other things. So you start to develop your tau pathologies and your beta amyloid and your glial cell activity. So if you get one of those pre senile genes, ouch. Um, but if you didn't, then you don't. So, you know, the tricky part there is historically we didn't know about pre senile genes. And so people would have children, and it wasn't until after they had their children. And then some people had it, some didn't. So we didn't realize that, oh, well, you had to get the one gene from the one parent because they only had to have one. And then they then developed their dementia. So, what we now know is we can identify those families who have that pre senile gene. Uh, and we do have them fairly well identified. You can double check and see if you're one of those people. If so, then we now know that, ooh, that's not a good gene to have. But it's also a fairly rare gene. I mean, that is not a very common form of Alzheimer's. It just isn't. Now, there's another thing that is, and it's called APOE. And then you can have one of three variations, two, three, or four. So if you have fours and you get a four from mom and a four from dad, ooh, your risk of getting Alzheimer's is pretty good. If you get a four from one and a three from the other, yeah, well, your risk is up a little, up some. If you get two twos, eh, not going to happen. If you get two threes, eh, not going to get it, except you still could get it, but not because you carry that gene. So it's a risk gene. There are other problems in, in the medical world that are, are sort of similar, aren't they, where it yeah. takes two really to, to tangle generally. Yeah, it's called a recessive gene. And so, or you have to have two of them to really for sure have the impact. If you only have one, your risk goes up, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. So, you know, with, within Alzheimer's, there's those variations. And then there are other reasons. It's called a spontaneous mutation, which means it doesn't have anything to do with genetics, really. Um, you're just, your system spontaneously mutated and you hit the jackpot. So, so these are these are things that we really can't worry about. Though. They're they're beyond our control. Let's yeah. look at some things that we can control because that's yeah. that's sort of our great hope, isn't it? For most of us, we want to. It is try and now, live. except Greg, I've, I've got to go back to it for because I only talked about Alzheimer's. See, this is this tricky part now. Down syndrome, ooh, trisomy 20, 21. Well, they they have those genetic codes. Only they get an extra copy. So the risk goes up. Now, different one like Lewy body or FTDs, 
Um, there are some of those, again, just like Alzheimer's, that would be genetically linked, but a lot of it is not. It's lifestyle and other things. So now let's talk about the risks because just like Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is not unique. Some of the other dementias are in that same boat where you know, you have a primary gene and then you have other related genes. Alzheimer's, now, we have at least five. Now, have you ever thought of going into politics? Because I always have a hard time getting a straight answer from you. <laughs> You know, if there were straight answers, we'd have a we'd have a cure for this condition. That's, That's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So now let's really change course and let's talk about risk factors we can do something about. Um, because I can't affect my gene pool. I truly can't. I mean, if I know my gene pool, it gives me some either solace, perhaps, or it gives me alert, or it makes me wonder. Okay, now I need to be extra careful on my other risk factors because I do have risk there. So let me see what I can do with these others. So some risk factors: blood pressure, blood sugar. Ooh, that's a biggie. Managing blood sugars, making sure you, if at all possible, do not get into insulin intolerance issues. Uh, rather hyper or hypoglycemic. Same thing with the blood pressure. Hypo or hyper, too high, too low, not good. We also know that um, sort of like cholesterol levels and lipid levels, those are risk factors. So the things you can do, what you take in, what you put in, what you put through is sort of important to understand because our brains and our bodies and our guts and our brains are actually more connected than we used to think they were. Um, and we also know that, that our stress level matters. So if we allow ourselves to have high cortisol levels over periods of time where we just put out cortisol, which is that stress hormone when we feel threatened, and it happens and it happens and it happens, um, we're actually predisposing our brain. We're increasing the risk that we're going to find that we start developing abnormal stuff going on in our brain. Uh, sleep, not being able to stay asleep at night more than anything. So you go to sleep, but then you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep. So it's an insomnia, but it's that difficulty of staying asleep. Um, that's a risk factor for developing dementia. Um, we can also look at social isolation. The more isolated we are socially, oh, that's a risk factor for developing dementia and nobody noticing it. Um, because if you don't use skills, you lose skills. And what we don't know is what happens to people if they maintain social connections. Now, the tricky part, Greg, is you have to pick somebody you like to be with to socialize. If you're around people you don't like, guess what it tends to do? Well, you know, if you throw a, an extrovert into a room full of introverts, it's kind of like throwing a cat in amongst the dogs. Meow, meow. Yeah, well, actually, it's a dog in amongst the cats on that case, I think, because the dog's the extrovert. Hey, let's have a party. And all the cats are like, uh, tear you apart. No. You, you could go the <laughs> other way. Um, but what we're saying is it increases your cortisol level because you're not getting what you like out of a social interaction. So matching the social needs and preferences of somebody is really sort of important to reduce risk. Um, and then it turns out, let me think, oh yeah, exercise. Diet and exercise, oh, you're a bummer. I know, it's an everyday thing. There's, oh. and, and hydration counts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, drinking enough fluids, but the fluid that's best for you is, I know you don't wanna hear it. Why? Beer? Oh. No. No water. Um, and so this idea of, you know, what we do matters, <laughs> what we do matters. Uh, living under threat for a long period of time, being isolated, being shoved in with people you don't like, um, not getting not getting good sleep, not exercising, not eating well, not not drinking effectively. I mean, you can only abuse a system so long before it goes, uncle. What did I read about um, lifelong learning being helpful? Oh, yeah. So when we talk about exercise, it's not just exercise for your body. It's exercise for your brain. So when we talk about exercise, just like social exercise, being with somebody is a social exercise. Brain activity, doing something different and unique, sort of build more pathways, fire some synapses, but physically doing the same kind of thing. It's, it's about being well, essentially. Spiritually well, physically well, socially well, mentally well. It, it adds up, apparently. Tifa, thank you very much.
You're welcome, I think. (laughs) You've been listening to the Dementia Care Partners podcast brought to you by Positive Approach to Care. If you'd like more information relating to dementia, simply Google tipasnow.com.